In Before You Quit Your Job, Robert Kiyosaki presents first-hand accounts of his own startup companies and how he learned from both his failures and his successes. Hold fast to our dreams and invent the future. Before You Quit Your Job is a tribute to entrepreneurs around the world who refuse to back down from their dreams. I acknowledge all those who have inspired me to never lose my passion to be a catalyst of change, to challenge the status quo, and to stay the course. Thank you, Robert T. Kiyosaki. Introduction What makes entrepreneurs different? One of the most frightening days of my life was the day I quit my job and officially became an entrepreneur. On that day, I knew there were no more steady paychecks, no more health insurance or retirement plans, no more days off for being sick or paid vacations. On that day, my income went to zero. The terror of not having a steady paycheck was one of the most frightening experiences I had ever experienced. Worst of all, I did not know how long it would be before I would have another steady paycheck. It might be years. The moment I quit my job, I knew the real reason why many employees do not become entrepreneurs. It is fear of not having any money, no guaranteed income, no steady paycheck. Very few people can operate for long periods of time without money. Entrepreneurs are different, and one of those differences is the ability to operate sanely and intelligently without money. On that same day, my expenses went up. As an entrepreneur, I had to rent an office, a parking stall, and a warehouse, buy a desk and a lamp, rent a phone, and pay for travel, hotels, taxis, meals, copies, pens, paper, staples, stationery, legal tablets, postage, brochures, products, and even coffee for the office. I also had to hire a secretary, an accountant, an attorney a bookkeeper, a business insurance agent, and even a janitorial service. These were all expenses my employer had once paid for me. I began to realize how expensive it had been to hire me as an employee. I realized that employees cost far more than the number of dollars reflected in their paychecks. So another difference between employees and entrepreneurs is that entrepreneurs need to know how to spend money, even if they have no money. The Start of a New Life The day I officially left the company, I was in San Juan, Puerto Rico. It was June 1978. I was in Puerto Rico because I was attending the Xerox Corporation's President's Club celebration, an event recognizing the top achievers in the company. People had come from all over the world to be recognized. It was a great event, a gala I will always remember. I could not believe how much money Xerox was spending just to recognize the top salespeople in the company. But even though it was a celebration, I was having a miserable time. Throughout the three-day event, all I could think about was leaving the job, the steady paycheck, and the security of the company. I realized that once the party in San Juan was over, I was going to go on my own. I was not going back to work at the Honolulu branch office or the Xerox Corporation. When leaving San Juan, our plane experienced some kind of emergency. In preparing to land at Miami, the pilot had us all brace, cradle our heads, and prepare for a possible crash. I was already feeling bad enough about this being my first day as an entrepreneur, but now I had to prepare to die on top of it? My first day as an entrepreneur was not off to a very good start. Obviously the plane did not crash, and I flew on to Chicago where I was going to do a sales presentation for my line of nylon surfer wallets. I arrived at the Chicago Mercantile Mart late because of the flight delays, and the client I was supposed to meet, a buyer from a large chain of department stores, was already gone. Once again, I thought to myself, this is not a good way to start my new career as an entrepreneur. If I don't make this sale, there will be no income for the business, 
no paycheck for me, and no food on the table. Since I like to eat, having no food disturbed me the most. Are some people born entrepreneurs? Are people born entrepreneurs or are they trained to be entrepreneurs? When I asked my rich dad his opinion on this age-old question, he said, Asking if people are born or trained to be entrepreneurs is a question that makes no sense. It would be like asking if people are born employees or trained to become employees. He went on to say, People are trainable. They can be trained to be either employees or entrepreneurs. The reason there are more employees than entrepreneurs is simply because our schools train young people to become employees. That is why so many parents say to their child, Go to school so you can get a good job. I have yet to hear any parent say, Go to school so you can become an entrepreneur. Employees are a new phenomenon. The employee is a rather new phenomenon. During the agrarian age, most people were entrepreneurs. Many were farmers who worked the king's lands. They did not receive a paycheck from the king. In fact, it was the other way around. The farmer paid the king a tax for the right to use the land. Those who were not farmers were tradespeople, a.k.a. small business entrepreneurs. They were butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. Their last names often reflected their business. That is why today many people are named Smith for the village blacksmith, Baker for bakery owners, and Farmer because their family's business was farming. They were entrepreneurs, not employees. Most children who were raised in entrepreneurial families followed in their parents' footsteps and also became entrepreneurs. Again, it is just a matter of training. It was during the Industrial Age that the demand for employees grew. In response, the government took over the task of mass education and adopted the Prussian system, upon which most Western school systems in the world are modeled. When you research the philosophy behind Prussian education, you will find that the stated purpose was to produce soldiers and employees, people who would follow orders and do as they were told. The Prussian system of education is a great system for mass-producing employees. It is a matter of training. The Most Famous Entrepreneurs You may also have noticed that many of our most famous entrepreneurs did not finish school. Some of those entrepreneurs are Thomas Edison, founder of General Electric, Henry Ford, founder of Ford Motor Company, Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, Richard Branson, founder of Virgin, Michael Dell, founder of Dell Computers, Steve Jobs, founder of Apple and Pixar, and Ted Turner, founder of CNN. Obviously, there are other entrepreneurs who did well in school, but few are as famous as these. The Transition from Employee to Entrepreneur I know I was not born a natural entrepreneur. I had to be trained. My rich dad guided me through a process of starting as an employee to eventually becoming an entrepreneur. For me, it was not an easy process. There was a lot I had to unlearn before I could begin to understand the lessons he was trying to teach me. It was difficult hearing what my rich dad had to say because what he said was exactly opposite from the lessons my poor dad was trying to teach me. Every time my rich dad talked about entrepreneurship, he was talking about freedom. Every time my poor dad talked to me about going to school to get a job, he was talking about security. The clash of these two philosophies going on in my head was confusing me. Finally, I asked rich dad about the difference in philosophies. I asked, aren't security and freedom the same thing? Smiling, he replied, Security and freedom are not the same. In fact, they are opposites. The more security you seek, the less freedom you have. The people with the most security are in jail. That is why it is called maximum security. He went on to say, 
If you want freedom, you need to let go of security. Employees desire security. Entrepreneurs seek freedom. So the question is, can anyone become an entrepreneur? My answer is yes. It begins with a change in philosophy. It begins with a desire for more freedom than security. From Caterpillar to Butterfly We all know that a caterpillar spins a cocoon and one day emerges as a butterfly. It is a change so profound it is known as a metamorphosis. One of the definitions of metamorphosis is a striking alteration in character. This book is about a similar metamorphosis. This book is about the changes a person goes through when transitioning from employee to entrepreneur. While many people dream of quitting their job and starting their own business, only a few actually do it. Why? Because the transition from employee to entrepreneur is more than changing jobs. It is a true metamorphosis. Entrepreneur Books Written by Non-Entrepreneurs Over the years, I have read many books about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. I studied the lives of entrepreneurs such as Thomas Edison, Bill Gates, Richard Branson, and Henry Ford. I also read books on different entrepreneurial philosophies and what makes some entrepreneurs better than others. In every book, good or bad, I found some priceless bit of information or wisdom that has helped me in my quest to become a better entrepreneur. Looking back at the books I have read, I noticed that they fall into two basic categories, books written by entrepreneurs and books written by non-entrepreneurs. Most of the books are written by non-entrepreneurs, people who are professional authors, journalists, or college professors. While I have gotten something important from every book, regardless of who wrote it, I did find something missing. What I found missing was that down in the gutter, kicked in the gut, stabbed in the back, terrifying mistakes and horror stories that almost every entrepreneur goes through. Most of the books paint a picture of the entrepreneur as a brilliant, suave, cool business person who handles every challenge with ease. The books about great entrepreneurs often make it sound like they were born entrepreneurs, and granted, many of them were. Just as there are natural and gifted athletes, there are natural and gifted entrepreneurs, and most books are written about such people. Books on entrepreneurship written by college professors have a different flavor. College professors tend to boil the subject to the bone, leaving only the static facts or findings. I find reading such technically correct books difficult because the reading is often boring. There is no meat left, nothing juicy, just the bones. How this book is different. This is a book about entrepreneurship written by an entrepreneur who has experienced the ups and downs, the successes and failures of the real world. Today, the Rich Dad Company is an international business with products in 42 different languages, doing business in over 55 countries. But it all started as a company that my wife Kim and I started in 1997. Our initial investment was $1,500. My first book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, has been on the New York Times bestseller list for over four and a half years, an accomplishment shared by only three other books. Maybe, as you listen to this book, it will still be on the list. Rather than tell you how smart I am at business, which I am not, I thought it better to write a different type of book on entrepreneurship. Rather than tell you how I brilliantly sailed over the tallest peaks and made millions, I thought you might learn more from how I dug many deep holes, fell into them, and then had to dig my way out. Rather than tell you about all my successes, I believe you will learn more from my failures. Why write about failures? Many people do not become entrepreneurs because they are afraid of failing. By writing about the things many people are afraid of, 
I hope to help you better decide if becoming an entrepreneur is for you. My intent is not to frighten you off. My intent is to provide a little real-world insight on the ups and downs of the process of becoming an entrepreneur. Another reason for writing about failures is that humans are designed to learn by making mistakes. We learn to walk by first falling down and then trying again. We learn to ride a bicycle by falling off and then trying again. If we had never risked falling, we would go through life crawling like caterpillars. One of the missing elements I have found in reading many of the books about entrepreneurship, especially those written by college professors, is that they do not go into the emotional trials and tribulations an entrepreneur goes through. They do not discuss what happens to entrepreneurs emotionally when the business fails, when they run out of money, when they have to let employees go, and when their investors and creditors come after them. How would most college professors know how a failing entrepreneur feels? How would they know, since a steady paycheck, tenure, always knowing the right answers, and never making mistakes are highly prized in the academic world? Again, it's all a matter of training. In the late 1980s, I was invited to do a talk on entrepreneurship at Columbia University. Rather than talk about my successes, I talked about my failures and how much I learned from my mistakes. The young audience asked a lot of questions and seemed genuinely interested in the ups and downs of becoming an entrepreneur. I talked about the fears we all face when starting a business and how I faced those fears. I shared with them some of the more stupid mistakes I made and how those mistakes later became valuable lessons I would never have learned if I had not made the mistakes. I talked about the pain of having to shut a business down and lay people off because of my incompetence. I also shared with them how all my mistakes eventually made me a better entrepreneur, very rich and, most important, financially free, never needing a job again. All in all, I thought it was an objective and realistic talk on the process of becoming an entrepreneur. A few weeks later, I found out that the faculty member who had invited me to speak at the university was called into her department head's office and reprimanded. His final words to her were, We do not allow failures to speak at Columbia. What is an entrepreneur? Now that we have torn into college professors, it is time to give them some credit. One of the better definitions of an entrepreneur is from Howard H. Stevenson, a professor at Harvard University. He says, Entrepreneurship is an approach to management that we define as follows. The pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. In my opinion, this is one of the most brilliant definitions of what an entrepreneur is. It is bare bones and brilliant. The Power of Excuses Many people want to become entrepreneurs, but always have some excuse for why they do not quit their job. Excuses such as, I don't have the money. I can't quit my job because I have kids to support. I don't have any contacts. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the time. I'm too busy. I can't find anyone who wants to help me. It takes too long to build a business. I'm afraid building a business is too risky for me. I don't like dealing with employees. I'm too old. The friend who gave me this article by Professor Stevenson said, Any two-year-old is an expert at making excuses. The reason most people who want to become entrepreneurs remain employees is that they have some excuse that keeps them from quitting their job and taking that leap of faith. For many people, the power of their excuse is more powerful than their dreams. Entrepreneurs are different. Mr. Stevenson had many other bare-bone gems in his article, especially when he compared promoters, entrepreneurs, to trustees, employees, as he labels them. A few of these gems of comparison are, 
When it comes to strategic orientation, promoter, driven by perception of opportunity, trustee, driven by control of resources. In other words, entrepreneurs are always looking for the opportunity without much regard to whether they have resources. Employee-type persons focus on what resources they have or do not have, which is why so many people say, how can I start my business? I don't have the money. An entrepreneur would say, tie up the deal and then we'll find the money. This difference in mindsets is a very big difference between an employee and an entrepreneur. This is also why my poor dad often said, I can't afford it. Being an employee, he looked at his resources. Those of you who have read or listened to my other books know that my rich dad forbade his son and me to ever say, I can't afford it. Instead, he taught us to look at opportunities and ask, how can I afford it? He was an entrepreneur. When it comes to management structure, promoter, flat with multiple informal networks, trustee, formalized hierarchy with multiple tiers. In other words, an entrepreneur will keep the organization small and lean, using cooperative relationships with strategic partners to grow the business. Employees want to build a hierarchy, which means a chain of command with them at the top. This is their concept of building an empire. An entrepreneur will grow the organization horizontally, which means outsourcing rather than bringing the work in-house. An employee wants to grow the organization vertically, which means hiring more employees. Formal organizational charts are very important to employees climbing the corporate ladder. In this book, you will find out how the Rich Dad Company stayed small yet grew big by using strong strategic partnerships and major publishers throughout the world. We decided to grow in this manner because it cost us less time, people, and money. We could grow faster, grow bigger, become very profitable, have a global presence, and yet remain small. We used other people's money and resources to grow the business. This book will explain how and why we did it that way. When it comes to reward philosophy, promoter, value-driven, performance-based, team-oriented, trustee, security-driven, resource-based, job promotion-oriented, in simple terms, employees want job security with a strong company, a steady paycheck, and the opportunity for promotion, a chance to climb the corporate ladder. Many employees consider a promotion and title more important than money. I know my poor dad did. He loved his title, Superintendent of Public Education, even though he was not paid much. The entrepreneur doesn't want to climb the corporate ladder. He or she wants to own the corporate ladder. An entrepreneur is not driven by a paycheck, but by results of the team. Also, as Howard Stevenson states, many entrepreneurs start a business because they have very strong values that are more important than simply job security and a steady paycheck. For many entrepreneurs, their values are more important than money. They are passionate about their work, their mission, and love what they do. Many entrepreneurs will do their work even though there is no money. Rich Dad said, many employees are passionate about their work only as long as there is a paycheck. In this book, you will also learn about the three different types of money, competitive money, cooperative money, and spiritual money. One, Competitive money is the type of money most people work for. They compete for jobs, promotions, pay raises, and against their business competition. Two, cooperative money is achieved by networking instead of competing. In this book, you will find out how the Rich Dad Company expanded rapidly with very little money, simply by working for cooperative money. Three, 
a significant part of this book is dedicated to the mission of a business, the values. While we all know that there are many entrepreneurs who are opportunists, working only for competitive money, there are others who build a business on a strong mission, working for spiritual money, the best of all money. Different Styles of Management There are two other points in the article that are refreshing, especially from a college professor. Howard Stevenson acknowledges that many people say that entrepreneurs are not good managers. Instead of agreeing with this commonly accepted point of view, he writes, The entrepreneur is stereotyped as egocentric and idiosyncratic and thus unable to manage. However, although the managerial task is substantially different for the entrepreneur, the management skill is nonetheless essential. Right on, Howard. In other words, entrepreneurs manage people differently. The next point explains why there are differences in management style between entrepreneurs and employees. Know how to use other people's resources. The other point Stevenson makes correlates closely with his definition of an entrepreneur. The definition is, entrepreneurship is an approach to management that we define as follows, the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. He states, entrepreneurs learn to use other people's resources well. This is what causes the difference in management style. Employees want to hire people so they can manage them. It puts them in direct control over them. They will do as they are told or they are fired. This is why employee types want to build vertical hierarchies. They want the Prussian style of management. They want people to jump when they say jump. Since entrepreneurs are not necessarily managing employees, they need to manage people differently. Very simply put, entrepreneurs need to know how to manage other entrepreneurs. If you say jump to an entrepreneur, he or she usually responds with some rude comment or gesture. So entrepreneurs are not poor managers, as many people think. They simply have a very different management style because they are managing people they cannot tell what to do or fire. This difference in management style also explains why employee types work for competitive money and entrepreneurs tend to work for cooperative money. Entrepreneurs looking for employees Some of the more common complaints heard from new entrepreneurs are I can't find good employees, or employees just don't want to work, or all employees want is more money. This is a problem for a new entrepreneur with a confused management style. Management style is a matter of training. Again, compliments to Howard Stevenson, a college professor, for getting to the bare-bones differences between entrepreneur and employee. Don't wait until all lights are green. Another reason many people are not as successful as they would like to be is fear, often the fear of making mistakes or the fear of failing. There is another reason, also a fear, but it appears a little differently. These people disguise their fears by being perfectionists. They are waiting for all the stars to line up before starting their business. They want all the lights to be green before they will pull out of the driveway. When it comes to entrepreneurship, many of these people are still stuck in the driveway with their engine idling. Three Parts of a Business Deal One of the best entrepreneurs I have ever known is a friend and business partner of mine. I have formed several companies with him, three that went public and have made us millions of dollars. He believes that there are three parts to putting a business deal together. One, finding the right people. Two, finding the right opportunity. Three, finding the money. He explained, rarely do all three pieces come together at the same time. 
Sometimes you have the people, but you do not have the deal or the money. Sometimes you have the money, but no deal or people. He also said, the most important job of an entrepreneur is to grab one piece and then begin to put the other two pieces together. That may take a week or it may take years, but if you have one piece, at least you've gotten started. In other words, an entrepreneur does not care if two out of three lights are red. In fact, an entrepreneur does not care if all three lights are red. Red lights do not prevent an entrepreneur from being an entrepreneur. Anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. Have you ever noticed that software, such as Microsoft Windows, comes in different versions? That means they have improved their product and now want you to buy the better version. In other words, the first product they sold you was not perfect. They may have sold it to you knowing that it had flaws and bugs and needed to be improved. Many people fail to get to market because they are constantly perfecting their product. Like the person who was waiting for all the lights to be green, some entrepreneurs never get to market because they are looking for, or working on, perfecting their product or writing the perfect business plan. My rich dad often said, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. Henry Ford said, thank God for my customers. They buy my products before they are perfected. In other words, entrepreneurs start and continue to improve themselves, their businesses, and their products. Many people will not start unless everything is perfect. That is why many of them never start. Knowing when to introduce a product into the marketplace is as much an art as it is a science. You may not want to wait for a product to be perfect. It may never be perfect. It just has to be good enough. It merely has to work well enough to be accepted in the marketplace. However, if the product is so flawed that it doesn't work for its intended purpose or otherwise does not meet marketplace expectations or causes problems, it can be very difficult to reestablish credibility and a reputation for quality. One of the marks of a successful entrepreneur is being able to assess the expectations of the marketplace and know when to stop developing and start marketing. If the product is put on the market a little prematurely, then the entrepreneur can simply improve it and take steps to maintain goodwill in the marketplace. On the other hand, delay in introducing a product can mean opportunities irretrievably lost, a window of opportunity missed. For those of you who remember the early versions of Windows, you'll recall how frequently your computer crashed. There were some who said that Windows was so full of bugs that it should have come with a can of insecticide. If an automobile broke down as frequently as Windows did, it would not have been acceptable in the marketplace. In fact, the automobile would have been a lemon and the manufacturer would have been forced to replace it. Windows, however, notwithstanding the bugs and the flaws, was phenomenally successful. Why was that? It filled a need in the marketplace and was not out of blind with marketplace expectations. Microsoft recognized a window of opportunity and started marketing. If Microsoft had waited for Windows to be perfect, it still would not be in the marketplace. Street Smarts versus School Smarts in martial arts, there is a saying that goes, a cup that is full is useless. Only when a cup is empty is it useful. This is true for the entrepreneur. We have all heard people say, oh, I know all about that. Those are words coming from a person whose cup is full. Those are the words coming from a person who believes he or she knows all the answers. An entrepreneur cannot afford to know all the answers. Entrepreneurs know that they can never know all the answers. They know their success requires that their cup is always empty. To be successful as employees, people need to know the right answers. If they do not know the right answers, 
they may be fired or not promoted. Entrepreneurs do not need to know all the answers. All they need to know is who to call. That is what advisors are all about. Employees are often trained to be specialists. Simply said, a specialist is someone who knows a lot about a little. His or her cup must be full. Entrepreneurs need to be generalists. Simply said, a generalist is someone who knows a little about a lot. His or her cup is empty. People go to school to become specialists. People go to school to become an accountant, attorney, secretary, nurse, doctor, engineer, or computer programmer. These are people who know a lot about a little. The more specialized people are, the more money they make, or at least they hope they make. What makes an entrepreneur different is entrepreneurs must know a little about accounting, the law, engineering systems, business systems, insurance, product design, finance, investing, people, sales, marketing, public speaking, raising capital, and dealing with different people trained in different specialties. True entrepreneurs know there is so much to know and so much they do not know that they cannot afford the luxury of specialization. That is why their cup must always be empty. They must always be learning. No graduation day. This means the entrepreneur must be a very proactive learner. Once I crossed the line from employee to entrepreneur, my real education began. I was soon reading every book on business I could get my hands on, reading financial newspapers and attending seminars. I knew I did not know all the answers. I knew I had to learn a lot and learn it fast. Today, nothing has changed. I know that my education as an entrepreneur will never have a graduation day. I will always be learning. In other words, when I am not working, I am reading or studying, and then applying what I learn to the business. Over the years, this constant study and then application to the business has been one of my most important habits for success. As I said, I was not a natural entrepreneur as some of my friends were, but as in the race between the turtle and the hare, I slowly but surely caught up with and passed some of my friends whose cups became full when they achieved success. A true entrepreneur has no graduation day. Over-specialized In Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant, the second book in the Rich Dad series, the E stands for employee. The S stands for self-employed, small business, or specialist. The B stands for big business owner. The I stands for investor. One of the reasons so many entrepreneurs are in the S quadrant rather than the B quadrant is that they are overly specialized. For example, medical doctors in private practice are technically entrepreneurs but may find it hard to migrate from the S quadrant to the B quadrant because their training is too specialized. Their cup is full. For a person to move from S to B, he or she will need more generalized training and must always have an empty cup. Here's a side note on the cash flow quadrant. One of the reasons why Rich Dad recommended I become an entrepreneur in the B and I quadrants is that the tax laws are most favorable in those quadrants. The tax laws are not as favorable for employees or self-employed people, the E and S quadrants. The tax code offers greater incentives, or loopholes, for people who either hire a lot of people in the B quadrant or invest in projects the government wants growth in, investments such as low-income housing. In summary, taxes are different in different quadrants. This book will go into the differences in each quadrant and how an entrepreneur can migrate from one quadrant to another, especially from the S quadrant to the B quadrant. A list of differences. Before quitting their jobs, people need to decide if they want to make the transition from employee to entrepreneur. The transition, 
or metamorphosis, requires a change to some of the following traits. A mindset of freedom instead of security. The ability to operate without money. The ability to operate without security. A focus on opportunity rather than resources. Different management styles to manage different people. The ability to manage people and resources they do not control. A focus on team and value rather than pay or promotion. An active learner. No graduation day. Generalized education rather than specialized. The courage to be responsible for the entire business. You may notice that farmers, possibly our earliest entrepreneurs, have had to develop most of these traits in order to survive as farmers. Most had to plant in the spring in order to harvest in the fall. Most had to pray that the weather was in their favor and that pests, diseases, and insects left enough for their family to live on through a long, hard winter. Rich Dad said, If you have the mindset and toughness of a farmer, you will be a great entrepreneur. A Pot of Gold at the End of the Rainbow While this book starts off describing the process of becoming an entrepreneur as a painful and time-consuming process, I also want to let you know that there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. As with any learning process, even learning to walk or ride a bicycle, the start of the process is always the hardest. You may recall that my first official day as an entrepreneur was not a good day. But if you stick with the learning process, your world will change, just as your world changed when you finally learned to walk or ride a bike. The same is true with entrepreneurship. For me, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow has been greater than my wildest dreams. The process of becoming an entrepreneur has made me far richer than I could have become as an employee. Also, I have become somewhat famous and recognized throughout the world. I doubt if I would have become famous as an employee. Most important, our products have reached people throughout the world and in some ways have helped to make their lives a little better. The best part of learning to be an entrepreneur is being able to serve more and more people. Being able to serve more people has been my primary reason for becoming an entrepreneur. The Philosophy of an Entrepreneur Becoming an entrepreneur began with a change of philosophy. The day in Puerto Rico that I left the Xerox Corporation, my philosophy shifted from the philosophy of my poor dad to the philosophy of my rich dad. The shift looked like this. From a desire for security to a desire for freedom. From a desire for a steady paycheck to the desire for great wealth. From seeing value in dependence to seeing value in independence. To make my own rules rather than obey someone else's rules. From a desire to give orders rather than take orders. A willingness to be fully responsible rather than say, it's not my job. To determine the culture of a company rather than try to fit into some other company's culture. To make a difference in this world rather than complain about the problems of the world. To find a problem and turn it into a business opportunity. To choose to be an entrepreneur rather than an employee. The New Super Entrepreneurs In 1989, the world went through perhaps the biggest change in history. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down and the Internet went up. In 1989, the Cold War ended and globalization started to take off. The world went from walls to web, from division to integration. In his best-selling book, The World is Flat, Thomas Friedman stated that when the wall came down and the web went up, the world went to one superpower, the United States. 
global supermarkets, and super individuals. My prediction is there will soon be new super entrepreneurs whose wealth will dwarf the wealth of today's mega rich entrepreneurs. In the 1980s, Bill Gates and Michael Dell were the hot young billionaire entrepreneurs. Then, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, founders of Google, and Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook became the hot new billionaire entrepreneurs. My prediction is the next super entrepreneurs will not be from the United States. Why? Once again, the answer is that walls have turned into webs. In 1996, the Telecom Reform Act and money from Wall Street gave rise to such companies as Global Crossing, a bankrupt company that did one important task. It linked the world with fiber optics. Once this fiber optic network was in place, brain power from countries such as India did not need to emigrate to Silicon Valley to find work. The brain power of India could now work from home for much lower wages. Due to the power of fiber optic cables and the Internet, my prediction is that the next Bill Gates or Sergey Brin will come from outside the United States, possibly from India, China, Singapore, Ireland, New Zealand, or Eastern Europe. Brain power, innovation, technology, and access to the world's supermarkets will create the next teenage multi-billionaire or trillionaire entrepreneur. Today, many Americans are panicked at the idea that our high-paying jobs are being outsourced, shipped not only to India, but all over the world. Today, even tasks performed by accountants, lawyers, stockbrokers, and travel agents can be performed somewhere else in the world for a lower price. No more high-paying jobs. So what does this do to the industrial age advice, go to school so you can find a good secure job with high pay, or work hard and climb the corporate ladder? In my opinion, this old industrial age advice is toast. Many employees will have less work to find, much less, since the person competing for their job lives thousands of miles away. Most of us know that wages have not gone up for many workers. How can their wages go up when someone else is willing to work for so much less? One big difference between an entrepreneur and an employee is that an entrepreneur is excited about the changes that the shift from wall to web is bringing. Many employees are terrified of the changes. One last difference. The last difference I will mention is the difference in pay between employees and entrepreneurs. Some of the most famous CEOs, like Steve Jobs and Warren Buffett, have the lowest salaries. Could it be because CEOs who are employees work for a paycheck, and CEOs who are entrepreneurs work for some other kind of pay? Are you an entrepreneur? As you can tell, there are differences between employees and entrepreneurs. The purpose of this book is to go deeper into those differences so you can decide, before you quit your job, if being an entrepreneur is the path for you. In conclusion, in my opinion, the biggest difference between an entrepreneur and an employee is found in the differences between the desire for security and the desire for freedom. My rich dad said, if you become a successful entrepreneur, you will come to know a freedom very few people will ever know. It is not simply a matter of having a lot of money or free time. It is freedom from the fear of fear itself. Freedom from the fear of fear, I asked. Nodding, he continued. When you look under the covers of the word security, you find fear hiding there. This is the reason most people say, get a good education. It's not out of the love of study or scholarship. It is out of fear, the fear you won't get a good job or be able to earn money. Look at how a teacher motivates students in school. 
it is motivation by fear. They say, if you don't study, you will fail. They use the fear of failing to motivate students to study. When the student graduates and gets a job, once again, the motivation is fear. Employers say, verbally or non-verbally, if you don't do your job, you'll be fired. The employee works harder out of fear, the fear of not putting food on the table or not having money to make the mortgage payments. The reason people crave security is fear. The problem with security is that it does not cure fear. It simply throws a blanket over the fear, but the fear is always there, like the boogeyman chuckling under the bed. Being in high school at the time, I could really relate to the idea of studying out of fear. In school, I only study because I am afraid of failing. I do not study because I want to learn. I am so afraid of failing that I study subjects I know I will never use. Nodding, Rich Dad said, Studying for security is not the same as studying for your freedom. People who study for freedom study different subjects than people who study for security. Why don't they offer a choice of study in school? I asked. I don't know, said Rich Dad. The problem with studying for security is that the fear is always there. And if the fear is always there, then you rarely feel secure. So you buy more insurance and think of ways to protect yourself. You always quietly worry, even if you pretend you're successful and have nothing to worry about. The worst thing about living a life of security is that you often lead two lives, the life you live and the unlived life you know you could be living. Those are some of the problems with studying for security. The biggest problem of all is that the fear is still there. So becoming an entrepreneur means you will not have any fear, I asked. Of course not, smiled Rich Dad. Only fools believe they have no fear. Fear is always present. Anyone who says he or she doesn't have fear is out of touch with reality. What I said is, freedom from the fear of fear. In other words, you don't have to be afraid of fear. You don't have to be a prisoner of fear. Fear will not define your world as it does most people's worlds. Instead of fearing fear, you will learn to confront fear and use it to your advantage. Instead of quitting because your business is out of money, because you are afraid of not being able to pay your bills, being a true entrepreneur will give you the courage to go forward, to think clearly, to study, to read, to talk to new people, to come up with new ideas and new actions. The desire for freedom can give you the courage to operate for years without needing a secure job or a steady paycheck. That is the kind of freedom I am talking about. It is the freedom from the fear of fear. We all have fear. The difference is whether fear causes us to seek security or to seek freedom. An employee will seek security. An entrepreneur will seek freedom. So, if security is the result of fear, what is the driving force behind freedom, I asked. Courage, smiled Rich Dad. The word courage comes from the French word le coeur, the heart. He paused for a moment and then finished the conversation by saying, your answer for choosing to be an entrepreneur or an employee is found in your heart. Freedom is more important than life. One of my favorite movies of all times is the classic Easy Rider, starring Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, and Jack Nicholson. In one of the scenes just before Jack Nicholson is killed, he talks with Dennis Hopper about freedom. I believe it is appropriate to end this introduction with those lines because it is why I chose to be an entrepreneur. I chose to be an entrepreneur to be free, for me, freedom is more important than life itself. In this scene, the three of them are camped in a swamp after being teased, threatened, and run out of town 
by a bunch of good old boys. Dennis Hopper. They're scared, man. Jack Nicholson. Oh, they're not scared of you. They're scared of what you represent. Dennis Hopper. All we represent to them is somebody who needs a haircut. Jack Nicholson. Oh, no. What you represent to them is freedom. Dennis Hopper. What the hell is wrong with freedom, man? That's what it's all about. Jack Nicholson. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what it's all about, all right. But talking about it and being it, that's two different things. I mean, it's real hard to be free when you're bought and sold in the marketplace. Of course, don't ever tell anybody that they're not free because they're going to get real busy killing and maiming to prove to you that they are. Oh, yeah, they're going to talk to you and talk to you and talk to you about individual freedom. But when they see a free individual, it's going to scare them. Dennis Hopper. Well, it don't make them run scared. Jack Nicholson. No, it makes them dangerous. Right after this scene, the three of them are ambushed and beaten by the same good old boys. Nicholson's character dies, and Fonda and Hopper ride on, eventually to be killed, not by the same good old boys, but by other good old boys who share the same philosophy. While the movie has different messages for different people, for me, the movie was about the courage it takes to be free, the freedom to be yourself, regardless of whether you are an entrepreneur or an employee. The rest of this book is dedicated to your freedom. Rich Dad's Entrepreneurial Lesson Number One A Successful Business is Created Before There Is a Business. Chapter One What is the difference between an employee and an entrepreneur? Starting with the Right Mindset When I was growing up, my poor dad often said, Go to school and get good grades so you can find a good job with good benefits. He was encouraging me to become an employee. My rich dad often said, Learn to build your own business and hire good people. He was encouraging me to become an entrepreneur. One day, I asked my rich dad what the difference was between an employee and an entrepreneur. His reply was, Employees look for a job after the business is built. An entrepreneur's work begins before there is a business. 99% Failure Rate Statistics show that 90% of all new businesses fail within the first five years. Statistics also show that 90% of the 10% that survive the first five years fail before their 10th anniversary. In other words, approximately 99% of all startup businesses fail within 10 years. Why? While the reasons are many, the following are some of the more critical ones. Our schools train students to be employees who look for jobs rather than train entrepreneurs who create jobs and businesses. The skills to be a good employee are not the same skills required to be a good entrepreneur. Many entrepreneurs fail to build a business. Instead, they work hard building a job that they own. They become self-employed rather than business owners. Many entrepreneurs work longer hours and are paid less per hour than their employees. Hence, many quit out of exhaustion. Many new entrepreneurs start without enough real-life experience and without enough capital. Many entrepreneurs have a great product or service, but don't have the business skills to build a successful business around that product or service. Building the Parachute My rich dad said, starting a business is like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute.